and if are in listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. This is the uh, NOAA MPA Center's webinar series, and I'm standing in today for Lauren Wenzel, who has had Capitol Hill Oceans Week. Um, and so I will be moderating today, and I wanted to let you know this webinar is co hosted by a MPA News, Open Channels, and the EBM Tools Network. And we actually also have Nick Weiner on today who is helping to, he's with Open Channels and is helping to co-host. So we're very pleased to have today here Martha Honey. Uh, she is going to be speaking about the impacts of coastal and cruise tourism, some lessons learned. Um, before we get started, I, I wanted to let you know uh, two things. First of all, you can ask questions uh, during and at the end of the webinar. Um, we'll hold all the substantive questions for the question and answer period at the end, but you can go ahead and send questions in throughout whenever you want. Mm -hmm. You can do that by typing the questions into your, the question panel of your user interface. If there's any quick clarifying questions, I might uh, stop Martha and ask her uh, during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll hold until the end. But you can send them in whenever. Um, I also wanted to let you know a little bit more about Martha. Um, so Dr. Martha Honey, and she is co-founder and executive director of the Center for Responsible Travel, CREST, uh, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Over the last two decades, she has written and lectured widely on ecotourism, travelers' philanthropy, cruise and resort tourism, and certification issues. Uh, she has two books already published, Ecotourism and Sustainable Development, Who Owns Paradise, published by Island Press in 1999 and 2008, and another book, Ecotourism and Certification, Setting Standards in Practice, also published by Island Press in 2002. She is currently writing a book um, due to be published this year on co coastal and cruise tourism called um, Selling Sunshine, also going to be published by Island Press, so stay tuned for that. Uh, previously, Martha worked for 20 years as a journalist uh, based in East Africa and Central America. She has a PhD in African history from uh, University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and she was executive director of the International Ecotourism Society from 2003 to 2006. She was profiled in Branded, Michael Conroy's book on certification, and she was named one of the world's top 10 eco and sustainable travel watchdogs by Condé Nast Traveler in 2008. So we're very pleased to have Martha here, and I will turn it over to you, Martha. Thank you very much, Sarah, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone, and I look forward to people's comments and questions at the end. So let me get started. Um, It's not going forward. You know what uh, often helps? This, this happens a lot. Actually, if you uh, come out of presentation mode and then go back into presentation mode, it usually unsticks. Wait, wait a second. It sort of freezes once it sits there for a while. I have to find where the whole thing is. Oh, escape works too. Escape should bring oh. it out of presentation mode. Yep. Okay. And now you just have to remember how you put it in presentation mode. Slideshow up on the top works. Can I get rid of all of the stuff that's in the slideshow? Oh, the user interface? Yeah. Oh, there's an orange button with a white arrow. If you click yeah. on that, it'll minimize it. Good. Now I can see. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. Oh, good. It worked. Well, Sarah gave you some of my background, which I was going to start with, so I won't along that, but simply to say that um, I was a journalist for 20 years, 10 based in Tanzania and East Africa, and another 10 based in Costa Rica. And it was really through the experiences of living in these countries that I came to see the importance to developing countries of tourism, um, and also the, many, many of the problems with tourism. And when I returned in the 1990s to the United States, I decided that I really wanted to take some time and try to look at what was then a rising phenomenon known as ecotourism and really try to figure out if there was any there there behind it, if it was just simply a marketing tool or if it was really something, some, uh, something of substance to it. Fortunately, I found that there was a lot of substance to it. There's also a lot of hype and, um, you know, and, and phoniness out there as well, but there certainly is a great deal of experimentation and a real commitment in, in many places of the world to try to do tourism in ways that brings tangible benefits to uh, both conservation and communities. So based on um, uh, my desire to find out about it, I ended up writing a book, as 
Sarah mentioned, and then doing um, an update of it 10 years later. Because so much of the field had changed, it was actually a, a substantial rewrite. Um, so that's my background. And coming out of the work that I did on, on for these books, um, I decided that I really wanted to devote my energies and time to uh, looking at and promoting sustainable tourism, um, ecotourism. And so in 2003, with a colleague at Stanford University, Bill Durham, we founded the Center for Responsible Travel. Um, and Bill retired last year. And until then, we had an office at Stanford as well. And now we're in the process of setting up a, uh, alliances with a consortium of universities, both in the US and elsewhere. We are a multidisciplinary organization, and we undertake research projects, field studies, um, reports, conferences. We make films and so on, all with the aim of sort of moving the needle on sustainable tourism, on undertaking projects that can really make policy differences in terms of how tourism functions. And um, we've worked in, in many different areas. But I think that one of the things that we have found is that in trying to promote the triple bottom line, it is the economic arguments, the dollars and cents, which are in many ways the easiest to nail down and probably the most compelling for industry and policymakers. So we've done a lot of a number of economic studies. And we've also moved in recent years to a, a, a real focus on coastal and marine tourism for reasons that I will discuss. So these are some of the studies we've done in the field of coastal and cruise tourism. Um, it's not only studies and reports and field projects, but as I mentioned, it's also some books and articles and uh, several films. And we have a new film which will be coming out later this year, which is looking at called Innovating the Caribbean. And it's really designed to show that there's more to the Caribbean than cruise tourism and all-inclusive resorts. So there are some great, really sustainable and uh, socially responsible tourism options out there. We've looked at four different countries in four islands of the Caribbean. So tourism, uh, international tourism, has been growing tremendously over the last number of years. And um, in 2012, it reached a milestone of passing one billion international travelers in one year, the first time ever. It's continued to grow even when there is economic downturn. Um, it may be slowed somewhat, but it never goes negative. And we, um, it is expected to reach um, 1.6 billion by 2020. Domestic tourism is about three, three and a half times um, greater than, than uh, international tourism. So tourism is the largest industry in the largest service industry in the world and the world's largest employer. And it is extremely important to developing countries. For many developing countries, it is the largest foreign exchange earner, oftentimes along with oil. What we have also seen in the last part, the last quarter of the 20th century, is a rise of uh, another concept of tourism, what was first known as ecotourism and now goes by a number of other names. But it, it, rose, it rose up in the late 1970s, really emerged as part of the global environmental movement, and was um, by the 1990s said to be the fastest growing sector within the tourism industry, growing at between 20 and 34 percent a year. Um, and in, in 1990, the International Ecotourism Society was founded, and they defined ecotourism as responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment and improves the welfare of local people. So basically, this is a definition that doesn't just describe what the tourist does, as most tourism definitions do, such as nature tourism or adventure tourism, but it also posits the impact of that tourism, and it says that if tourism is done well, those, those impacts can be positive on the environment and positive on local communities. By, 2000, by the year 2000, um, ecotourism was said to be netting about $156 billion a year. In 2002, the, international, the United Nations declared the International Year of Ecotourism. And for many of us working in the field, this was um, a real indication that what had started out as in the late 1970s as sort of a good idea. and a, um, a lot of individual experiments had by 2002 coalesced into a global movement where it had really put down roots in many countries around the world. And today, nearly every country that is involved in tourism is also promoting ecotourism. Some, some part of its industry is also called ecotourism. And in fact, ecotourism is having an impact on the entire industry. 
We've also seen today the emergence of a number of new terms that are, are basically um, hold the same core principles as ecotourism. Some of these terms you may have heard, geotourism, pro-poor tourism, sustainable tourism, and responsible tourism, which is what my organization, Responsible Travel, is the term that we use. But basically, all of, all, all of these terms hold the same principles, that tourism done well should bring tangible benefits to conservation, to local communities, and be educational as well as enjoyable for the traveler. What I'm going to talk to you about today is um, I'm going to focus more clearly on tourism and its, its as both a victim of and contributor to climate change. And much of the work that we have been doing um, in recent years at the Center for Responsible Travel has focused on the Caribbean and Central America. So many of my examples will be drawn from these regions. In terms of uh, coastal tourism, the impacts from climate change are many. And here's a a list of them, sea level rise, unprecedented heat, increasing storms, and so on. Uh, many that I'm, of these phenomena I, I know you, you all are familiar with. And we have seen in the Caribbean, for instance, warmer oceans, sea level rise, um, increased intensity of hurricanes. This is Hurricane Ivan that hit Grenada head on, a, 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 um, a Category 3 hurricane that hit in 2004 and wiped out 90% of the tourism industry and the infrastructure on the island, and about 80% of the nutmeg crop that was their main barn um, agricultural crop, did tremendous damage, which is still in some ways visible today. We've also seen coral destruction coming from um, increases in, in, um, in sea level rise and sea temperature. And today, the Caribbean's uh, coral reefs have virtually collapsed in many places mostly due to overfishing and climate change. And according to a new report by the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, this report says that live coral coverage in the Caribbean reefs is now down to a mere 8% of what it was in the mid-20th century. In terms of the uh, annual cost and capital costs of sea level rise, for the CARICOM countries, these are these are about 20 of the countries. These are 20 of the countries in the Caribbean. It is estimated that the capital costs at a mid-range level of sea level rise, that would be one meter, um, by 2050 will be 26 billion. Will have totaled 26 billion, and by the uh, 2080s will have totaled 68 over 68 billion. And then if sea level rise is higher, up to two meters, it will be considerably more. So we're seeing not only, of course, environmental damage, but incredible uh, financial uh, economic damage also from increasing climate change. Coastal tourism is not only a victim of, as I said, but it also contributes to climate change. It, it plays, it has a dual role. And it, uh, it contributes through greenhouse gas, gas emissions, um, tourism done badly destroys coral, can destroy coral reefs. Uh, it is competition for fresh water, sand mining, and destruction of sand dunes, and so on. Here we have a loss of coral, seagrass, and mangroves um, in uh, in Grenada that has come through uh, badly badly done tourism projects. And we also have beach and shore, shoreline mining of sand to use in tourism projects that destroys the beaches and the dunes. And we've seen a decline in fishing stock, fish stocks um, globally and including in the Caribbean. And this has come in part from overfishing to supply uh, both the tourism sector but also um, for export and for locals. And basically, unsustainable fishing practices have resulted in over overfishing, over exploitation of many, many um, species. One of the most important is the parrotfish, which is greatly endangered in the Caribbean. And ultimately, the uh, reef structure, because it's so important for coral, coral reefs, ultimately reef structure will become hollow, and swells and storms will hit the coastline with much more force if fish such as the um, parrotfish, which, which clean the coral uh, and help keep it healthy, are not um, preserved. And, and some Caribbean islands, such as Bermuda and Bonaire, um, are already protecting their parrotfish 
with, um, in order to increase the health of their leaves. So in terms of um, the uh, contribution that the tourism sector makes to global uh, CO2 emissions, we see that, um, that, that tourism obviously is a very complicated industry with lots of different, different sectors. And um, we see that the various sectors contribute different amounts with um, air transportation contributing the most. They, make, they contribute about 40% of the CO2 emissions that uh, come from the tourism sector. And overall, the tourism sector contributes about 5% of global CO2 emissions. So now looking at the impacts of coral tourism, I want to look a little in a little more detail at the growth of coastal tourism and some of the economic, social, and, econo and environmental impacts that we are seeing, particularly in the Caribbean and Central America. Sun, sand, and sea tourism is the fastest growing and most lucrative sector of the tourism industry. We live on and near the beaches. More than half of the world's population lives within 50 miles of coastlines. And um, it is, this is predicted, predicted to rise to 75% by 2025. We also vacation on the beaches uh, on our coasts. 80% of, of tourism takes place in coastal areas. And 12 of the top 15 international, um, top international destinations are countries with coastlines. But large-scale um, resort tourism and cruise tourism that is done that has been growing very rapidly and often un unsustainably is destroying mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs, draining fresh water from the aquifers, and polluting beaches and coastal waters. There is an alternative, as I mentioned, and that is ecotourism and sustain sustainable tourism. And in many places, we're seeing along the coastlines a competition between what we call high volume, value, high value ecotourism and high volume industrial style cruise and all-inclusive resort tourism. The country of Costa Rica probably exemplifies this better than any other um, country because Costa Rica early on, back in the 1990s, first developed ecotourism. And it was only after it had a well-developed ecotourism sector and had become internationally known as an ecotourism destination that it began to develop large-scale um, all-inclusive resort tourism and to a more limited extent coastal tourism. Just to give you a little background, it was in 1987, um, during the 1980s, Central America was, as I'm sure some of you know, awash with, uh, civil, with civil wars, um, geopolitical wars, in virtually every country in the region except Costa Rica, which didn't have a, an army um, and was sort of a backwater to the conflicts, although it certainly had illegal um, U.S. troops and other troops stationed within it within its borders illegally and clandestinely and that was the reason that brought me there as a journalist but in any case it was in that, so tourism during these years was down in every country in the region including in Costa Rica it was declining year by year then in 1987 Costa Rica's president at the time Oscar Arias won the Nobel Peace Prize because he was the author of what was called the Central American Peace Plan that officially ended the wars throughout the region. And it was after that, once peace had returned more or less to the region and Costa Rica began to take on another image, one with a Nobel laureate president and uh, people began to look more closely at Costa Rica as a vacation spot, that ecotourism took off. And literally, within about five years, Costa Rica was being declared in the media as the leading, a leading ecotourism destination in the world. The interesting thing is, and I was living in, had, was fortunate to be living in the country during these years, was that this was largely um, a homegrown type of tourism. It was small scale, nature based, spread throughout the country, and based around, first, first of all, based around its national park system, and then it spread to other parts of the country. And um, many of the, the people who own eco lodges or other parts of the ecotourism industry were either Costa Ricans drawn from the middle class, the upper class, or foreigners who had made Costa Rica their home. So that most of the money from this type of tourism went back into the country. It was reinvested into the country. And many of the early owners also brought a strong social and, and uh, environmental ethic to what they were doing. And so they were committed to trying to better the places where they were working. 
And it turned out that this model, which had very little foreign investment, outright foreign investment, no international um, hotel chains, and was really done on Costa Rica's good social welfare system and strength of its middle class and so on. Um, and it became enormously successful. By the mid-1990s, it had surpassed um, agriculture as the leading export earner. And within two decades, Costa Rica had doubled what it was earning per tourist. So tourism went up sevenfold, and its earnings went up 14-fold within two decades. So this proved not only a good model environmentally and socially, but also economically. One of the um, places that ecotourism first started was um, around Manuel Antonio Park, which is a, a, a gem of a park that's uh, completely surrounded. It's on a peninsula completely surrounded by, by the sea. And um, one of the early eco lodges there is called Sea Comano uh, Resort and Wildlife Reserve. It's a, it's a medium-sized lodge with 50, just 58 rooms. And it has now been certified with five green leaves under Costa Rica's Certification for Sustainable Tourism program, which issues eco-labels to, um, to those companies that pass muster, that, that meet its criteria. And C. Pomino is one of a handful that has gotten the top rating. It has a reserve which protects the habitat for the endangered um, TT monkey. It, and in the 30 acres that are part of its property, it, uh, its construction only had to cut down less than 1% of the trees. It captures rainwater and has reduced um, its consumption of, um, of water by 35% compared with comparable hotels. It produces organic fertilizer and grows much of its own food in its own gardens. And it has solar panels and um, produces, uh, uses 50% less electricity than, again, other comparable hotels. But over the years, it has become increasingly surrounded by a more intense, large-scale resort and vacation home developments, what we can call the other Costa Rica. This, um, this Pacific Coast development of large-scale tourism really took off after about 2000. It was fueled in part by the economic boom in the U.S. and um, an increasing desire for coastal tourism and, to some extent, um, resort tour uh, big, uh, retirement homes in along Costa Rica's coast. And it also led to some increase in cruise tourism on the Pacific Coast. What we saw was that the main, imp the main impetus, the main um, factor that allowed the tremendous growth of, of large-scale coastal tourism, in addition to the booming U.S. markets, which brought in investors, was uh, the, the creation of a new international airport in the town of Liberia, which is near the, the uh, Pacific coast in Guanacaste. And literally within a few years, um, this area became known as the Gold Coast, and today we have over a hundred large-scale, all-inclusive, or coastal resorts um, that are within one to two hours of the Liberia Airport. The, the idea is that large-scale resorts want to be able to move there, and, and large international airports want to be able to move large numbers of passengers and move them to the resort within a couple of hours. So now you can fly to Costa Rica from the U.S. and literally from some places like Atlanta or Miami, be on the beach in half a day. This brought uh, with it a number of problems. And I'll just um, highlight one, one example, which is the Hotel Rui, which has developed two large resorts, actually the largest resorts in Costa Rica, on uh, the Matapalo uh, Beach in Guanacaste. This is a Spanish all-inclusive hotel chain that has um, that has resorts throughout the Caribbean. And um, in in building these resorts, they clear-cut the land, filled in the mangroves, and became mired in a host of controversy um, that played out in the newspapers, agitation by environmental groups and local communities, and legal cases against their building. Workers died during the construction, and they were closed down several times. Today, the Ryu website boasts that the resort is uh, fully integrated into the, into the fragile medium, which is of great ecological value. Well, Press sent a film crew out to check out this claim on its website, and what we found was something quite different. We produced in 2003 um, a film which looks at the growth of big, large-scale tourism along the Pacific coast. And I wanted to play for you, I hope it works, um, this uh, clip from 
from the film, which is about the hotel Rui. Toda esta zona que vemos para este lado está certificada como bosque, patrimonio forestal de, del Estado. Esta parte para aquí que no tiene árboles es la parte que maneja el hotel y eh, parte de, de ese terreno estaba con bosque, estaba con árboles y fue cortado. En esta playa, según este documento del Ministerio de Ambiente, había cuatro manglares en color rosado. Uno, dos, tres y cuatro. Este manglar, el número dos, fue desaparecido totalmente. En este lugar es otro estero manglar que hay en estas playas. Esto, parecido, similar, era lo que había en el otro lado. Sobre un humedal no se puede construir. Y sobre un humedal no puede haber absolutamente nada. De acuerdo a las informaciones preliminares, aparentemente en el sitio sí existía un humedal. La legislación está ahí. Ahí la tenemos. Hay que mejorarla así, pero no hemos aplicado el 100% lo que tenemos. Hoy en día hay huellas de todo tipo de vehículos con motor. Sin embargo, a la par de eso, estas otras huellas que son de tortugas marinas que entran a desovar y estas tortugas se nota que dio vueltas por varios lados y no encontró dónde desovar a causa del de cambio que se hizo en el terreno. Esto es, es parte de el, uh, pasar por encima de las leyes que le es permitido a las grandes cadenas hoteleras y solamente la ley se aplica a los pequeños. So, as this clip shows, Costa Rica does have some strong environmental laws, but even the environmental tribunal, um, Jose Lino, who spoke, admits that these laws are oftentimes stepped over, abandoned, and developers would rather pay the very modest fees than comply with them. So in this case, mangroves were cut down, filled in, and the beach has been taken over by beach chairs and tourists, and the, the turtles come up looking for a place to lay their eggs and have been returning to the sea unable to lay their eggs. This is, these are just some of the, the many problems that this large hotel development has caused. Toda esta zona, oops. So another part of many of these large scale developments are golf courses. Golf courses are basically considered a necessary component of an all-inclusive resort but they have very serious environmental impacts. They consume a lot of water, they take fertilizers, a great deal of fertilizer, and oftentimes specialized grasses. The water consumption of most golf, a typical golf course is said to be as much as what a village of five to 10,000 people consumes in a day. And one of the things that we found in looking at the growth of golf courses and the, um, the um, prevalence of putting in golf courses uh, with big resorts is we looked at how many tourists actually play golf in Costa Rica. And of the international tourists coming to Costa Rica, only 2% play golf. The same figure in Mexico, only 2% of international tourists in Mexico also play golf. Um, and virtually no Costa Ricans or Mexicans play golf in their own country. So the question is, why are big resorts building very expensive golf courses? And the reason is that they build homes or condominiums, vacation homes around the golf courses sell them as being on green space and therefore can sell the condominiums at somewhere between 20 and 70 percent more. So basically it's a real estate decision, it's speculation that um, is driving the growth of golf courses. And this particular golf course in Costa Rica is being, um, is be, has been called an eco, uh, eco golf estates, the, the condos around it are called eco golf estates. So they're capitalizing on Costa Rica's eco image but certainly this golf course and the condos have nothing to do with, with ecotourism. The second area I want to talk briefly about is cruise tourism, which also, like, um, like coastal tourism, has grown tremendously over the last few years. We've seen both a growth and a consolidation of the cruise industry. There are three major cruise lines, and the size, number, passengers, ports of call, and profits are all on the rise. In fact, the number of passengers has increased 40-fold up between uh, 1970 and 2012, and it's projected to, uh, they're projected to double again between 2008 and 2018. Basically, what we have now are sort of floating cities um, with passengers and crews up to 10,000 on some of the, the biggest ships. 
The Caribbean is the most popular um, cruise destination. In fact, the Caribbean is the most tourism intense region in the world. And the U.S. is the world's largest source market for cruise tourism. We saw post 9-11 a tremendous growth in cruise tourism and the opening of many new ports of call, including along both sides of the of U.S. coast. So Miami is no longer the, 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 the sole demarcate, uh, 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 post for, for taking a cruise, place you had to fly to, to take a cruise. Now many, many cities have cruise ports in the U.S. and you can leave on a cruise by simply driving there and getting on a boat. Cruise tourism impacts on the oceans are, are multiple, from air pollution, from, um, from the fuels that they use, to oily discharge, uh, invasive species which are carried from one place to another in the ballast water, dumping of waste at sea which became um, well known um, through exposés by Greenpeace and others, and um, actually a, a ship with 3,000 passengers is said to produce 30 thousand gallons of raw sewage a day, as, again as much as a small city. Seventy percent of the, the uh, cruises are in biodiversity hotspots, environmentally sensitive areas in the Caribbean and also in Alaska. And we've seen um, a number of disasters including of course the famous one um, in the lower picture here of the um, Concordia that went down off the coast of Italy in 2012. Um, and uh, it, it was in a marine protected area off the coast of Italy. It cost, um, I, I think it was about 20, hundreds of millions of, of dollars in, in terms of cleanup. I don't have it exactly here. We also see impacts on ports of call, and this has been an area where Crest has done a lot of work. We see both environmental, social, and economic impacts. We've done studies in Belize, Honduras, and Costa Rica looking at these impacts. There's anecdotal evidence of, of uh, environmental and social impacts from um, de decrease in the, in the quality of coral reefs from too many people, too many cruise passengers swimming on them in, in uncontrolled ways, um, a degrading and commodifying of culture as we see here in what's called Costa Maya in Mahawal along the, the lower Mexican Yucatan coast where they um, built a fake village and take people there, whose passengers go there and pretend that they're seeing Mayan culture. And then an overpowering of historic cities and skylines such as we see in the lower picture in Venice. But it is the economic impacts, these, um, the environmental and, and social impacts take years to really measure in, in real scientific terms. Um, and it is the economic impacts that we've been able to get uh, the, the clearest handle on to date. And that's um, really what, what we focused on in our studies. So just to give you one, one example, the study that we did in Costa Rica, we tried to compare the economic value of cruise tourism and compare it to stayover tourism or overnight tourism, tourists who fly into Costa Rica. And what we found was that there are six times, what, the year we did the study, there were six times more overnight visitors coming to Costa Rica than cruise passengers. Uh, cruise passengers spent on average $55 a day, overnight visitors spent on average $120 a day or more than double. The total spending per visit of a cruise passenger again was just $55 because they stayed less than one day. Overnight passengers spent um, out for their total visit $1,000 um, or 18 times more than cruise passengers. And overall if you take into account the taxes and, and other income that is generated for both sectors, cruise and overnight, Overnight tourism is putting 111 times more into the Costa Rican economy than is cruise tourism. So six times more visitors, but 111 times more value, economic value. So our recommendation to the Costa Rican government was do not, do not invest any more in cruise tourism. Similar findings have come out of the Caribbean, mainly done by the Caribbean Tourism Organization, where uh, cruise tourism, over 50% of cruise tourism, uh, takes place in the Caribbean, but less than 5% of the industry's gross revenue stays in the Caribbean. Most of it leaves the Caribbean. And we found similar findings um, as we found in, um, in Costa Rica, that overnight, um, is gener overnight tourism is generating seven times more than cruise tourism overall in the Caribbean, and uh, that overnight stayover passengers spend much more uh, $994 on average per visit compared with $77 for cruise passengers, again 18 times more for stayover visitors. 
And a very interesting study that was done by a professor um, in Jamaica, he found that St. Martin, um, what typically happens is that the countries who are involved with, with cruise tourism uh, become a port of call, have to, are, are required to put in infrastructure for the cruise um, for the cruise lines to come and dock there or and, and let off their passengers. And so St. Martin's invested $400 million in um, infrastructure to attract cruise tourism to, to the island. They are currently earning only $9 million a year from cruise tourism. So this means their repayment time without any interest is 138 years. So again, we believe the conclusion should be that government should not invest further in cruise tourism in the Caribbean. So, as we've seen, tourism is often part of the problem, but it can also be part of the solution. And this is an area that we have really tried to focus on. We have held now three um, international symposiums or, uh, or in what we call innovators in coastal and marine tourism. The first was held at Stanford University 2010, then one in Los Cabos in Mexico 2013, one last year in Grenada, and we have an upcoming think tank which is focused specifically on coastal and marine tourism and climate change, which will take place in Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic um, next month. And the idea of these is to bring together some of the innovators, people who are doing tourism coastal tourism, marine tourism in different ways, in, in more socially and environmentally responsible ways, to help them to share their experience, share their expertise, and to help to build them into a more sort of self-conscious and active uh, social force within the tourism industry. So these innovators in coastal tourism, there are many benefits that they bring. They, they seek to balance um, their, their lodges, their, their resorts, with the environment and with and to involve the local communities and local cultures in respectful ways. They bring tend to bring in what we call high value tourists, tourists who stay longer, spend more, want to see more of the country, don't simply stay with inside a, a gated community. Um, and so this high value tourism is much more economically as well as socially and environmentally valuable than high value high volume cruise or all inclusive tourism. And these businesses practice some of the internationally recognized um, best practices. With climate change, we have come to believe that sustainability is no longer simply a lifestyle choice, as it was for many of these early eco lodges, but now it is a business imperative. There is no choice but that businesses have to move to be more sustainable because of the realities of climate change. These are some of the um, some of some examples of some of the the leading hotels and cruise lines that we have been working with, small cruise lines that are doing alternative models, more sustainable models of tourism, mainly in the Caribbean and some in, uh, in, in Central and North America. For instance, just a couple of examples, we have the Punta Cana Resort in the Dominican Republic where we're going to have our, our next uh, think, our think tank in next month. Um, they are actively involved in coral restoration um, of the reef that's right in front of the hotel. Tourists have an opportunity to go out and help to replant um, the the uh, coral reef, and they have. And then after it is replanted and has taken hold, then it is moved back to the original reef. This has proved highly successful, and they have planted. Um, uh, let me see, a hundred, a thousand meters of coral has been transplanted back into the reef by tourists who have helped um, with this with this operation. Uh, in Grenada, hotels are supporting what has become a very popular underwater sculpture garden, which is um, a, a sculpture made a, a whole bunch of different statues made out of cement, like this, like this one here, and they have been placed into the first um, marine protected area in Grenada, and so they are drawing tourists to this new uh, marine protected area and helping to raise money for the for the protected area. This has been named by National Geographic as um, one of the top 25 wonders of the world. And um, it is also providing jobs for guides, boatmen, and dive instructors. In Turnoff Atoll in Belize, um, the tourism lodges there have worked with local fishers, um, commercial fishermen, 
to um, set up a marine protected area that is jointly run by the by the lodges and the um, the commercial fishermen and is seen to be benefiting both creating stocks that are both important new stocks protecting stocks that are important both for tourism um, and for sport fishing as well as for commercial fishing so you've seen rather than as has happened in many places, a battle between tourism and, and fishermen. Here you have a real unity around creating a new protected area. In addition, there have been efforts by a number of hotels to link more to local industries and to cut down dependency on imports. Food, of course, is one of the big areas. Many hotels now are, <clears throat> have developed their own gardens or are buying locally from local farmers. This is um, one hotel, the Montevana Hotel, with its with its farm that um, grows many of its food, much of its food. Similarly, the Bellacampo um, Resort in Belize is now growing 70% of its food is produced on, on site, and so they don't have they import very little from overseas. And we're seeing in a number of hotels efforts to reduce the use of uh, of both chemicals that are harmful to the environment to cut down on water consumption and electricity consumption. The Calabash Hotel in Grenada, which has been Green Globe certified, is, is one example where they uh, have used um, a much more healthy purification system for the swimming pool and they have a uh, low flow um, water for their, um, for their, uh, in their in their guest rooms for the toilets and showers and use recycled water on their gardens. And the um, uh, Hikaro uh, Island Eco Lodge in, in Nicaragua is an example of a lodge that is built completely with, um, with entirely with timber that was reclaimed after um, Hurricane Felix. The buildings and the furniture are made from tropical hardwood that are all FSC certified Rainforest Alliance certification and uh, no new trees were cut down to build this beautiful lodge. And then one of the places we work most closely with is called the, the Kutiantara uh, Beach Resort in Aruba. It, um, it is certified by Green Globe and a number of other international certifications. And they are doing a host of, um, let me just go back, they are doing a host of um, environmentally and socially responsible um, in initiatives. They do regularly do beach cleanups with their guests. They um, have, uh, of course, sink and shower water is treated and reused uh, in, in the gardens, and they have only native plants. Uh, they have solar power. They managed to reduce tremendously their, their um, electricity consumption. Um, and, and they have been awarded a number of awards by TripAdvisor, Condé Nast um, Travel Magazine, voters, and so on. So in conclusion, the Main, some of the main recommendations that we have come up with through our work, both looking at some of the problems with coastal tourism, the impacts of climate change, and, some, and many of the innovations that are being done by our uh, tourism partners, is that we believe it is important for countries to promote high value rather than high volume tourism. We need to stop counting tourism success in terms of numbers of arrivals, but rather in terms of the economic um, the economic, uh, the, the money that stays behind, how much of the tourism dollar is retained by the country, because so much of it leaks out. We need to have, uh, we need to be centering on using local assets, not foreign imports. We need to create linkages to the local economy and reduce leakages from the economy. We need to also be targeting the growing number of socially and environmentally aware consumers. We've done a number of consumer studies and pulled together a lot of studies and the whole sector of tourists who are interested in traveling in ways that are more socially and environmentally responsible is growing. And this is not only true in the US, but also in, the, in, in Europe. And so it is important to have a mix of nationalities so you're not dependent on, on simply one country. Um, and so we recommend that countries in the Caribbean look not just to the US market, but also to the European market. We need to de-emphasize, we propose de-emphasizing the um, building of all-inclusive resorts, large vacation home complexes, 
and developing cruise tourism because these leave very little in the in the local economy and can have very serious environmental and social uh, impacts, negative impacts. And finally, we believe it's it's important for countries to provide incentives green, to green developers. Unfortunately, oftentimes incentives are provided to foreign investors. We think we need to be much more countries should be much more discriminating and provide it to those developers, whether they're local or foreign, who are really doing green developments and also are oper are not only building to the highest of green standards, but are also operating the resorts and the businesses to um, international accepted best practices. So those are my remarks. Here are my here's my contact information, and I look forward to any questions you might have or comments. Okay, thank you so much, Martha. This was fascinating. Um, before we get started with the questions, I wanted to let everyone uh, know you can ask Martha questions by typing in your question into the question panel, the user interface, and then I can relay it to Martha. Okay, so let's see. This one arrived um, during the webinar, and could you specify how you arrived at the costs of sea level rise, and, and what do the costs involve? Yes, this was a study done by um, by Carib Save, and I can send the person the, the link to it, um, the, the source for it. But um, we, we didn't do the study ourselves, but it was done by Carib Save, which is um, focusing on tourism in the Caribbean as one of its missions. Okay. So if, if we get the name of the person, I'd be happy to send the source. Okay. And, and Miriam, maybe you could, uh, you, Martha's email address is right there, and if, if not, I can connect you after, afterwards. Okay. Um, another question. Um, are tour leaders ever invited to trainings or provide with materials about um, not handling coral and coral reefs? Or well, that's that's a very good question. Um, you know, it really depends on the if, if it's uh, the, the tour operator. There's some tour operators. There's been a, there's a whole certification program for tour operators in in a number of places. And um, some of the best, of course, are, are training their tour operators and um, not handling the the, reef, the, the coral and uh, what is good behavior on the reef. Unfortunately, what we have found and others have found is that, for instance, with cruise tourists, the cruise tourism, so many pass passengers are put off onto reefs at a time, and they're very lightly supervised. And so, um, the the people who run the MPAs or the um, tourism businesses that use the same reefs are reporting in many cases that there is destruction, uh, there's, they're seeing destruction from from um, too many cruise passengers being unsupervised or only lightly supervised on the reefs. So this this is something that is extremely important and, and is part of best practices within um, sort of certification programs for tour operators. Okay, thank you Martha. Um, and now a question comment. So all very good once the visitor gets to the destination, but most of the carbon footprint will be from the getting there. Is this a topic for the July meeting? Yes. I mean, airline travel, of course, is a very hot topic within and, and its carbon footprint within the um, tourism industry. And there have been, um, there, there are divisions. There are people who are arguing for um, no fly for you know, local vacations, not traveling. Our point of view is that travel is so important at a number of levels. It's extremely important, for, as I mentioned in my talk, for developing countries that are very dependent oftentimes on, on very high quality ecotourism. And if people don't go to visit their economies, they're going to suffer tremendously. It is also a way that that we, particularly we Americans, who tend to be so ignorant of the rest of the world, can learn and learn in ways that um, is really interactive and engaged if tourism is done well. And therefore, it is um, an educational tool that I think we do not want to give up. So what Crest argues is not don't fly, but fly smart. If you can take a train, if you can take uh, a bus, if you can travel in some other way, do it. Try to uh, package your long haul trips so that you stay longer and um, uh, in a place, and don't simply go back and back and forth uh, multiple times. Try to think carefully about um, you know about when you're going to take a long haul trip and, uh, and and use it well. 
and also there are a host now of carbon offset programs where you can contribute to, to tree planting or some kind of environmentally sound um, uh, environmental protection projects um, as, as part of your trip. You pay something and it goes into environmental projects. This doesn't change the environmental footprint of air traffic. And I think the real answer has to come from innovations that need to be made by the, the, the um, travel industry, by the, by the um, air transport industry, and also pressure from governments and the public. And we are beginning to see that in, in a number of airlines. We're seeing, obviously, they're saving money on it, but a, a tremendous effort to use um, engines that, that consume less fuel. And we've just seen, I, I believe it's finished its mission, but um, the first solar-powered plane that flew around the world. So we're beginning to see changes within the aviation industry, and I think that we need to keep the pressure up, both from governments, the public, and so on, <clears throat> and so that these kind of innovations continue within the industry, and hopefully someday we get to a plane, to, to planes that are not so dependent on fossil fuels. Okay, thank you, Martha. Uh, we've had a flood of questions, so we're not going to be able to get to them all, so I'll just pick a couple more the time we have, and then uh, I'll be able to provide you with the questions so you can see what they were. Um, okay, does Crest provide a list of the most responsible ecotourism facilities in various countries to help tourists select their vacation site, and or a list of the best environmentally sustainable certification programs to look for? Yeah, we don't. We we have some bits and pieces of that. We we have a sheet on you know sort of tips for for responsible travel, which is on our website. <clears throat> I'd be happy to send it to the person who asked the question, um, and that has a number of websites to go to to look for um, responsible travel trips and so on. We also run this is sort of a plug for us, but we run a number of online auctions each year, which are fundraisers for us. But they also are we get donations from some of the absolutely lead, leading, most wonderful travel companies around the world to go to the Galapagos or go to East Africa or places in the U.S. So on many many um, options. We have one if you go to our website that's up and running now, a smaller auction. But we run. Three, three, four, sometimes five auctions a year, and this is an important fundraiser for us. And we vet the people we accept, the companies we accept trips from, very carefully. We build this as an auction for responsible tourism packages. And the good news is that you, you will, if you take part in it, you will surely get it below cost. Most of our trips sell for about half the market value. Okay, that's good to know. Um, are there, and this is my first question, are there any websites that would help you with only, well, that would search sort of like kayak search for um, eco-friendly? Um, there are, I'll just name one, there are a number, and, and this, this um, sort of, this tips packet that we have has, has a number of them in it, but one of them is very close to ours, it, our, our website is responsibletravel.org, it's responsibletravel.com. And this is out of UK, and it's a list of responsible tourism operators around the world and hotels and so on, and you can book through them. And this is one of the, the, the most um, well-established uh, websites, so I would highly recommend that. Okay, great. Um, the question, are the beachside resorts adjacent to reefs taking steps to manage their guest use impacts on those reefs? Again, it depends on the resort. Punta Cana, as I, I showed you, because they are they're a large resort, but they have a real mission to um, for environmental stewardship and, and social responsibility, and and they certainly do. And you go, you have to go out with a guide, and it's carefully managed. And then, if you, of course, if you want to, you can help with replanting the coral. So a number of resorts do that. Unfortunately, many of the large chain hotels don't. Um, and this is this is certainly an area where more work is needed. We need to begin to infuse the good values that have been sort of developed by the smaller hotels and the more responsible hotels within the entire industry. Okay. Um, another question. Um, wondering about the disconnect between government policies, uh, for example, in what we saw in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. and what you would suggest to governments and ministries of tourism um, in your recommendations. Yes, so, I mean there is there is a, 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 a disconnect. I, sort of the classic disconnect is that tourism ministries judge their success on increasing the number of visitors, and that's all that they look at. So they look for more large-scale hotels.
hotels to be built or more cruise lines to come in because that will increase the number of arrivals each year. As I argue, we firmly believe that it is much better to look at how to attract and keep stayover visitors who are higher value. The ecotourists, are those looking for sustainable to, to more responsible vacations and so on, who will stay longer, spend more, visit more parts of the, 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 the country, spread their dollars or their, 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 their tourist spending around the country so more businesses benefit and so on. This is really where, um, where tourism ministries need to be looking and they need to be measuring how much of the tourist dollar actually stays in the country, not how much comes in, how much stays in. Because the leakage in some, some of the islands in some places is as much as 90%. And so they, they show great expansion and great growth in, on their books, but the reality is much different. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and do you know if there are any initiatives or restrictive measures to move the cruise ship industry in the direction of responsible travel? Is there a way back from the Econo Mega Cruise? Well, first of all, there are a whole host of smaller cruise lines, what we call pocket cruises, usually under 200 passengers. <clears throat> Lindblad Expeditions and um, Windjammer, a number of these that specialize in one um, smaller cruises, so it's more intimate. They have a much, much lower impact on both on the sea and on the ports of call. And they really tend to be much more educational, real learning experiences, rather than simply you know, kind of packaged entertainment. Um, and so those are the choices that are out there. Unfortunately, the smaller cruises also tend to be more expensive than the, the large cruises. But um, there are some initiatives. There are some movements. For instance, the city of Charleston has had a big campaign, and we played some role in that where they have been opposing the um, docking of uh, Carnival Cruises right on the right downtown Charleston, which is an eyesore on the skyline and dumps way too many people into this historic di district at one time, uh, and so on. In Venice, there's also where Venice is just being overrun with cruise ships. There's, there are also, there's a movie that's been made about Venice. There are active groups working there and so on. It's a field that I think is beginning to grow. We need to do a lot more work on, on moving cruise lines. I mean, I feel in many ways that um, in many places, cru the cruise ships have gotten so big that they really should not come into ports of call. They should simply stay at, at sea and be sort of party ships at sea, but not come into fragile islands or fragile um, cities like Venice or Charleston, uh, where they really disrupt and undermine the high quality tourism that exists there and the, and the, the, the way of life that exists there. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Martha. Um, another question. How would you respond to the concern that responsible tourism may be more costly, therefore only available to those with higher incomes? Yeah. I think this, this, this is a real challenge um, for those of us committed to responsible tourism, we want to keep travel democratic and we want to keep it available to both people who live within the country where tourism is going on and to people to be able to travel as backpackers or in you know, less expensive vacations. I think there are companies that are not high-end that are doing wonderful tours, uh, Intrepid Tours, which I think perhaps I mentioned earlier, um, out of Australia has a line that is, you know, really very reasonable tours, again, done with the highest of social and environmental integrity. Um, and, and there are other companies you have to look. It, frankly, it is easier to develop a very high-end lodge that is very environmentally sustainable. Uh, because you're getting a lot of money from, from high paying guests than it is to develop um, a, a resort that is uh, still sustainable but, but charges less. So we've seen a lot of the investment in, in sustainable tourism go into boutique lodges that command a high price. And I think we, we need to work very hard. One way to help keep tourism accessible to, to common people, to ordinary people, is through the national parks. I firmly believe that national parks should be free or very cheap for nationals and that international guests who are visiting those parks should pay much more and help underwrite the cost of them. But school kids, school classes, and 
you know, local people should be able to visit and encouraged to visit um, uh, in, you know, the, the parks so that they learn about them and they also buy into the, the need to protect them. They see the value of them. This has happened in Costa Rica where now during the rainy season, what they market as the green season, we don't talk about the rainy season, uh, many of the hotels, because they're not getting so many international visitors, give lower prices packages for locals. And I think that this is really smart. This opens up. It keeps the hotels, keeps people employed, keeps the hotels open and so on. But it also makes tourism more democratic. Okay, thank you, Martha. Um, also, there was an FYI that came in. Uh, it said Carnival just announced a new brand called Fathom to focus on social impact travel, volunteerism, and destinations. Are you familiar with that, Martha? I'm very familiar. I was interviewed for one of the stories about it. Yes, yes. I mean, I shouldn't laugh, but you know, we we need to see what happens. But I think that one of the things that we've seen, and this is an area that. Crest is working on, you know, we have a whole web, separate website and projects on it, what we call Traveler's Philanthropy, um, which includes volu what's called volunteerism, vol volunteer vacations. And there's been an enormous interest and upswell um, in, in uh, offerings of volunteer vacations. I, um, I think that this comes from a good place, that people want to give back to the destinations that they're visiting, and that is great. But I think it has to be done well. We need to have standards and we need to have protocols for how it's done. And I particularly feel this if it's going to involve um, tourists visiting with um, taking part in projects that involve vulnerable populations like orphanages or um, places with AIDS patients or um, other 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 human populations that are that are that are vulnerable. I don't think it's appropriate for tourists to go for a few hours and basically play with the orphans. Um, these children are not pets in a zoo, and they expectations are raised and so on that are not met by these short visits. Um, and I but I think so. I think we have to be very careful about the kind of projects that are that are picked. And I worry when you are as Carnival has announced, going to be bringing hundreds of people to do social service projects in the Dominican Republic beginning next year is what they've announced and then they want to roll it out to Cuba and other places. I think one of the things we have to be careful of is that these volunteers are not taking jobs from local people. If you're doing construction or doing painting, I would argue it's much better to for tourists to contribute money so that that can go to hire a local person to do those what are basically fairly routine jobs. Um, if people have very special skills that are not not available in in the destination, then volunteering absolutely can be can be a value. Eye surgeons and um, so on. But I think it it's it's a whole area of tourism that I think needs much more scrutiny um, and 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 to be done in a much more careful way. It's great for the people who are volunteering. They come away feeling um, very positive in, in almost all cases by these experiences. I worry that many of the recipients, the organizations and the individuals who are receiving these, this, these volunteer activities are not always so, ha so happy. We did a couple of years ago, we've done a whole book called On Traveler's Philanthropy, Handbook on Traveler's Philanthropy. It's available on our website and it has a number of very thoughtful essays on this topic including volunteerism, and I would urge people to take a look at that if they're interested in this. But it is an, an area both that's growing rapidly and one where we need more good research and more protocols and, and, and best practices developed. Okay, Martha, thank you so much. Uh, we still have a bunch more questions, but we're going to have to end now. But thank you. You've given us all a lot to think about um, and a lot to work towards. Well, it's been my pleasure. Uh, I, I appreciate very much you having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So. Uh, and everyone, thank, we appreciate you coming. Um, Martha has a contact information there, and then there's the Crest website where you can uh, download a lot of their publications. So I'd encourage everyone to study up. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, afternoon, morning, wherever you are.